Hi. Uh, is the mic on? Sorry for the delay. I was just waiting for one of our speakers um, who's just held up, but they're further held up, so we will just begin anyway. I won't uh, waste any more of your time. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, it is the anniversary of 10 years of WikiLeaks starting today, um, and this uh, is the first showing of a video that we have, have for this. Anyway, welcome to the State Department. I think we have some interns in the back. Welcome. Uh, good to see you in this uh, exercise in transparency and democracy. <laughs> a decade ago, we knew a lot less about the world's powerful leaders and institutions. We knew only what they wanted us to know. Don't worry, be happy. 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 We didn't know how casually they broke the law or stitched up trade deals, how routinely they conducted mass surveillance or kidnapped, indefinitely detained, tortured, or even murdered people. But then, the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks is getting ready for a bombshell. WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. The guy ought to be, and I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I don't want to do it. Illegally shoot the son of a <laughs> WikiLeaks. 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 I think the man is a high tech terrorist. Julian Assange founded WikiLeaks, a media organization unlike any other. In one decade, WikiLeaks has published more secret documents than all the rest of the world's media combined. WikiLeaks has published more than 10 million documents, more than 10 million words. If you print them out, they would reach the center of the earth and then come out the other side. To celebrate WikiLeaks' birthday, here are the top 10 greatest hits, 10 publications that helped us all better understand the world we live in. In 2007, WikiLeaks showed us inside Guantanamo Bay by publishing the manuals and standard operating procedures used to hide prisoners from the Red Cross, as well as PR guides used to eliminate certain words like suicide or to rename a hunger strike as voluntary fasting. 500,000 documents make up the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs, the most detailed description of war to have ever been published. Each attack and death is listed, including 15,000 kills that have been kept secret from the public. When European oil company Trafigura dumped illegal toxic chemicals in the Ivory Coast, it convinced a British court to gag the BBC and The Guardian. WikiLeaks published the gag documents breaking the censorship ban. In 2010, WikiLeaks revealed how a US Apache helicopter killed 18 people, including two journalists, and people in a van driving children to school. What shocked the world was the video game commentary of soldiers eager to kill. The children from the van were severely injured in the attack. Their father and the other adults in the van were killed. The United States strongly condemns the illegal disclosure of classified information. Later that year, WikiLeaks released over 250,000 secret U.S. diplomatic cables about every country in the world. Cablegate exposed wrongdoing on every continent. WikiLeaks exposed the largest international agreements that the world has ever seen, the three big T's which are being negotiated in secret. The three big T's are big business's new strategy to bypass the World Trade Organization and ensure that they get to set the international rules of what other countries can and cannot do. Today, WikiLeaks begins its release of emails documenting the private lives and private lives of private clients. WikiLeaks revealed the inner workings of private intelligence company Stratfor that provides advice to U.S. government agencies, arms companies, and Dow Chemical, who hired Stratfor to spy on the victims of the largest chemical disaster in history caused by their plant in Bhopal, India. With the 2.3 million emails published in the Syria files, 
including the emails of its head of state, Bashar al-Assad. Wikileaks revealed the true nature of the Syrian elite. The Syria files also shed light on how Western companies profited from Syria by breaching sanctions. Wikileaks revealed the U.S. National Security Agency's spying on world leaders, including Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany and the U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, the last three French presidents and President Berlusconi of Italy. Finally, coming in at number 10 are the emails of the U.S. Democratic National Committee, which showed how the DNC undemocratically and illicitly stacked the deck against Bernie Sanders. As a result of those leaks, the DNC's five top heads rolled. For the 10 million documents published, and the 10 million more to come, let us all wish Wikileaks a happy 10th birthday. To help Wikileaks publish the next 10 million documents, go to wikileaks.org forward slash donate. Yeah, I suppose when you put it all like that, it's no wonder I feel a bit tired today. Um, so yeah, 10 years. Um, this day, uh, 10 years ago, the domain wikileaks.org was registered. Since then, we've published over 10 million documents. That's over 10 billion words. That's more secret documents than the rest of the world's media combined. Sorry to everyone in the room. Um, uh, about... Um, uh, they cover ev uh, they cover information about every country on the world, um, and we've partnered to bring these revelations out with over a hundred media organisations over the decades that we have been around so far. We're going to be celebrating over the next ten weeks with um, new events uh, being announced all the time. Quite a number of supporter of activities. Um, that people can get involved in. We have promotions on our book, the WikiLeaks files. Um, this is the hardback copy, but the paperback is about to be launched. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going out um, over these next 10 weeks um, on the sort of supporter community side. Um, we actually have uh, some quotes coming in, some happy birthday quotes. There's one that came in just this morning from Chomsky, um, which you might be interested in. He says, uh, on our birthday, WikiLeaks has provided a unique and quite outstanding service to people of the world, bringing to them information that they should and deserve to have, and that has been illegitimately concealed by systems of power. So it all began 10 years ago with the concept of an online Dropbox that Julian Assange devised. Uh, this concept, we're very proud to say, has now become a lot more normalized and has spawned in a number of media rooms around the world. The concept here was that um, there was a system that was possible to be built, that he did build successfully, that people could submit documents online, that means they could upload them and get them directly to a media organization anonymously. Um, we are now on our second generation submission system. We relaunched it um, just over a year ago. Um, it has become clear, as I'm sure all of you are aware, um, the NSA surveillance capabilities. We started understanding uh, in quite a lot of detail about these capabilities um, back in 2010 with some of our releases there, and a lot more as we can uh, uh, continued with spy files in 2011, and it became clear that a lot of uh, a lot more um, uh, parts were needed for our Dropbox to make it uh, secure in this mass surveillance age. Um, also, we'd uh, grown our area of expertise in the whole operational side of source protection. So there's some unique elements of our Dropbox. For example, um, the fact that the instructions can be read from every single page on the website. So we actually even mask who is even considering submitting a document. You can't even an analyze the internet traffic to our site and see who might even be considering and wanting to understand the tools they'll need. Um, so we've stayed uh, at the, the top of our game on our Dropbox over the whole decade. And of course, our online Dropbox uh, began netting leaks uh, very, very early on. Um, in, uh, it was just a couple of months later that our first publication uh, came through. Uh, and since then, they've just kept coming. Uh, we've had, for example, quite a lot on uh, Guantanamo Bay. 
These began in 20, uh, sorry, in 2007 uh, with the standard operating procedures that came out then. These showed uh, the regulations uh, around torture, propaganda uses by the US government to try and cover up their illegal behavior within Guantanamo Bay. Um, what, what happened with the, with the Guantanamo uh, files, we've noticed actually happens in quite a lot of areas that when we start publishing, the impacts that we go for, that we promise our sources, is very successful. And other sources of other information relating to that topic understand the expertise that we have in the area that we've generated, the media partners ready to work on those topics. And often as uh, uh, something, a submission and a publication on one specific topic will net more on the same topic. So after we began in 2007 on Guantanamo, uh, documents about Guantanamo Bay, we actually just continued to get more, and we were pu we've been publishing up until um, 2011. Uh, we, we still had some more on Guantanamo Bay. Um, there's a number of these. We will be looking um, at every week over the 10-week period at different topics, themes, or countries, um, and these stats and information will, will be coming out. Um, some other examples of some early on documents, there's a couple of interesting ones. Um, German Media, Focus Magazine. Uh, back at the 11th of August 2008, we released the missing pages of the Schaefer Report into the illegal spying by German intelligence on the German press. The 2006 report, uh, compiled by a former federal judge, investigated spying on journalists by Germany's BND, the secret intelligence service here. Uh, which is forbidden under German law. The missing pages contain detailed descriptions about the BND's contacts with Focus mag magazine. Um, the code name Jerez for one of the journalists there was Huffelschulter, who was uh, in contact with them quite a lot, which was shown through, through these documents. Um, we also released just the year before that in 2007, uh, the Stasi files, showing that the Stasi was still in charge of these Stasi archives. Um, then we moved through and we started getting a new trend coming in in 2010. Um, we started getting a large lot of document sets that were large archives. We began quite famously in 2010, Collateral Murder. Um, I joined the organization just after that and I was part of one of the first of these large archives, the Afghan war logs, that we put out in 2010. That was over 90,000 uh, reports from the war in Afghanistan, from the US troops on the ground there. Uh, this was uh, the first time that a media organization was publishing such a large set of documents in this way. It was a first for us at that time, but uh, has a trend that has just continued and has grown. Uh, a few months after that, we published similar reports from Iraq, uh, 40,000. These showing, for example, one such revelation from these reports was that the um, US government uh, would not be reporting a number of instances of torture abuse claims that, um, that were received. And then, later that year, 250,000 cables. Um, these were diplomatic documents from the US State Department. And we began in 2010 uh, with uh, publishing 250,000 cables. This was uh, a publication that ended up with 100 media partners. We were publishing for several months. Um, this produced uh, amazing results all around the world. A couple um, uh, that show the impact, for example, it's, uh, the cables have been cited by Tunisian academics for having contributed significantly to the revolution in Tunisia. Um, they also uh, were one of the main basis for immunity being withdrawn um, in, in Iraq. The Prime Minister at the time explained that this was a reason, the information in the cables, for them taking away immunity for US troops. And there's an interesting case which really showed us um, and started to develop our publishing model that we have been um, uh, finessing over the last several years. And what we realized with Cablegate was that actually if one is just working with media and as much as that does help on an impact side initially, there is a huge impact for archives, the very nature of them, of people being able to explore full archives and see trends in documents is um, not only allows for more stories and information to get out that wouldn't otherwise be picked up by media, but is actually very empowering for the public. 
Um, there was a case specifically that showed us that if we just allowed waiting for headlines, then the stories um, that all deserved to come to the forefront wouldn't necessarily. There's a German citizen, uh, Khaled El Masri. He has the, happens to have the same name as a suspected terrorist. And he had been, um, while he was on holiday in Macedonia, kidnapped by the CIA, secretly renditioned, tortured. Um, and then after several months after they discovered that actually they had the wrong person, he just happened to have the same name, the CIA just sort of dumped him out on the road. And he had terrible trouble trying to get a court case up. The US just said he had no standing. There was no documentation about the secret rendition, etc., etc. In the end, although K uh, partners did not p uh, pick up those cables to publish them initially, when we put out the entire set of Cablegate unredacted, he was able to go through, him and his legal team, they found the documents that were actually able to get them uh, and they were able to use them in the ECCHR case that he took that was eventually successful. And this really started to show us the value of publishing these full archives, not just searchable, but the full archives so that the public can interact with them. And this is something that we've kept on with doing and you will know a number of our more recent releases, the DNC emails, Hillary emails, etc. We are keeping with this um, having understood the value of publishing full of ar large archives. Um, of course, for this, we got at quite a number of attacks. Um, the biggest and most interesting for me that we get, um, obviously we get DDoS attacks and technically people try to take us down. We're very successful and always have been at staying online. We don't unpublish documents, our links aren't broken. But the one that was most interesting to me are the propaganda attacks that we get. And we've been living with these for several years. The first um, one that we were hit with when I joined was the blood on your hands with the Iraq war logs, which I found just incredible even at the time, we were literally publishing the deaths, the deaths at their hands of tens of thousands of people and somehow this was turned around that because we explained to the world that the US were knowingly doing this, we uh, somehow had blood on our hands, which of course is um, not true at all. And what was interesting with this story that still is occasionally repeated, although predominantly people have come to understand that it is just based on a bunch of lies, was that actually this point was brought up in the trial of Chelsea Manning. And the US government tried very hard to try and show in that trial that um, there had been any harm done from any of these publications. This was something they wanted to use against Manning and, of course, Julian and WikiLeaks. And what was interesting was that the US government themselves, despite having successfully brought up this talking point, were actually able to find no evidence of harm. Um, and you can see some of the quotes here, and there are, uh, it became very clear in the trial that actually even the US government don't have any facts to back up their point. And we've seen these sorts of propaganda attacks continue. We're going through quite a large one at the moment. Doesn't surprise us at all. We've also come to understand quite a large trend with these propaganda attacks that every time we're about to publish or we're publishing large things or um, we're in the middle of a, a big investigative uh, partnership with a large archive that's coming out and it's very clear in the power that this is coming and the powers that be or the organization that we are publishing about whose large and secrets we are revealing does start in this big propaganda spin against us. And so with the large amount of documents that um, are clearly coming, that Julian has made a few uh, small references to recently, and of course some have come out, the DNC emails, etc. Of course, as is usual for us, a large spin, uh, spin machine went into play against us. And there have been, it seems, quite some digging through past publications. There really is, it seems to me, quite a concern attack to go in through and just try and find anything. Um, of course, as is usual, when you start to pick them apart, none of these actually work. I'll just look at a couple of them now um, that have come out recently um, just, to, just to illustrate, I suppose, how easily falsifiable and based on no facts to just spin and it is interesting to me that it is all happening at this time where clearly um, we are at quite a height of publication um, so for example Russian agents I'm 
apparently a Russian spy. We don't publish anything on Russia. Apparently it's a bit too difficult to Google WikiLeaks Russia and see the 2.3 million emails um, that we've uh, put out exposing Assad's regime because apparently we were not publishing on Russia and Syria. All the 650,000 documents that we've published on Russia, um, that was apparently a bit too difficult to fact check. Um, what's another good one we've had recently? Oh yeah, the Turkish one. Oh, this was this was funny. Um, yeah, so then there was a big hoopla online because um, apparently we published some data on Turkish women and everybody was getting very upset and it was personal, etc., etc. The most amazing lack of fact-checking here what was being referred to was not even anything that we'd published. And in fact, the person that did publish it actually stated that it wasn't us, that they'd published it, and they had now removed it after this criticism. But apparently, well, we'll just ignore the tweet. We'll just ignore people explaining they published it. No, no, no. We'll attribute it completely falsely to WikiLeaks and uh, try and get up this, uh, this spin. Um, so for us, these sorts of attacks um, are quite interesting. It's interesting to see the type of reaction and spin one gets. As I say, these are always, we've seen the trend, it is a reaction from an organization or entity um, that we are publishing about. Um, they are bringing it up in defense. And so it is actually interesting for us generally to see the types of attacks, the type of spin and propaganda that is tried to be worked up because this actually tells us even more about the organization, interestingly enough, that we were revealing about in the first place. Um, so yeah, as long as journalists are willing to not fact check, we're uh, willing to, to do it afterwards. Um, um, and we've learned that the main lesson through this is with through these prop propaganda attacks is just keep publishing. We publish real documents, true documents, source documents. They speak for themselves. The public can interact with them themselves. And that is and always has been and is now 10 million or 10 billion, depending on if you prefer words or documents, uh, that many times that we have been proven correct on this. And so we will keep publishing. It has been 10, 10 years and 10 million documents so far, and there are a lot more coming. Uh, we've got, um, uh, Julian will be speaking a bit more about that in a second. Um, but right now, um, we're just going to hear from uh, one of our media partners briefly. Um, the other one was uh, due to be joining us, John Getz. Sadly, he's been held up. Oh, no, he's here. <laughs> Just at the last minute. Grand entrance, hey, John. I know your game. Uh, Stefania and John, if you'd like to come and join me. So John Getz is a um, uh, German journalist here. Um, and uh, Stefania has come from Italy. And they're just going to say a few words about um, working with WikiLeaks as media partners. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, good. So, hi, good morning. Uh, I'm here not because I have special wisdom. I'm a journalist like you. I just want to share share my experience of 10, year, <clears throat> ten years of um, WikiLeaks. I spent the last seven years working, partnering with WikiLeaks, working on all their releases from the Afghan war logs to the latest releases. So I, I have quite a lot of experience. And um, so, your name, your name. sorry, Stefania sure. Maurizzi, and it'll also be on the slide at the end, and it should be in if you've got one of these packs, it should be there. But <laughs> Stefania, yeah, Stefania Maurizzi, yes. I work in but yeah, it'll be on the slide at the end, Stefania. I'm sorry. working for the Italian news magazine, The Express, and the Italian Daily, La Repubblica. So uh, basically, uh, it all started in uh, 2007 when one of my high-value sources was basically destroyed, had very serious consequences, for, just for contacting me just for trying to contact a journalist. So at that point, I realized that the well-established techniques to protect, journal to protect sources with journalists use are no longer working. We need something better. So I'm a mathematician. Before <laughs> journalism, I got a degree in mathematics. So I have a, uh, good sources in um, cryptography. And one of my high-level sources in cryptography told me, 
Well, you should have a, a, a look on that bunch of lunatics. And the lunatics were <laughs> the WikiLeaks guy. Just, uh, WikiLeaks had, had just been established, so very, very few people knew about even the name of WikiLeaks. So that, that top-level source in cryptography put WikiLeaks on my radar screen. And I started looking at this organization, their work, what they were, how they were publishing things, what, how they were basically operating, and uh, I got very interested in their methods and their, uh, <clears throat> in their approach to journalism because it was uh, a good approach, a different, very different approach uh, to journalism. And uh, suddenly, in uh, 2009, one night in, in July 2009, at 3 a.m. in the morning, someone called me, we are WikiLeaks, <laughs> okay? You, could you please get up and go to your computer because we have a file and we, you, you need to get this file before it is um, too late. Please go to your computer and uh, could you please help to verify the authenticity of this file? So I went to the... <clears throat> I accessed this file and realized that it was very important. It was a file about the garbage crisis in Naples. Probably you know this crisis because it was it hit the headlines around the world. And it was basically the alleged role of the Italian secret services in this crisis. So I, I, at that point, I realized their methods. I realized how they were operating. Though at that time I knew very little and I started tracking them down, trying to understand who they are, how they work. And that was on each of the releases. And I can tell you, I could tell you some good paranoia stories about the, the um, paranoia of getting fake documents. Uh, but I could tell you also, <clears throat> could also tell you a very good story about tough journalistic work uh, for uh, getting, uh, verifying these documents and uh, try to put them in a context, getting good stories because this is what journalism is about, verifying documents, finding angles, finding stories and make these stories accessible to the, la to the large public. And when you go to the court, when you get libel cases about this, this story, well, you have to be sure you publish very, very uh, good and very uh, and absolutely genuine documents because you go to the court and you risk personally you and your and your newspaper of course and we went to the court and we won the case when we when we got libel cases about our WikiLeaks releases well I could tell you how important I mean uh, it was thanks to WikiLeaks documents that we were able to learn what happened behind the scene of the um, of the story, the Italian story. Actually, it is an international story. You probably know the the extraordinary rendition of the Milan cleric Abu Omar. Abu Omar <coughs> was kidnapped in Milan, and basically, Italy is the only country which nailed the CIA agents involved in this rendition. And thanks to WikiLeaks cables, we were able to understand what happened behind the scene, how the US government tried to put pressure on the Italian prosecutors and in the Italian politicians in order not to have this case going, going ahead in the court. And uh, I could tell you what, what happened with the Syria files when we discovered the Italian arms giant Finn Mechanica selling this uh, communication equipment, military equipment to the Assad regime. And uh, in that case, we got a libel case. So we, we, we got a major libel case, but we were able to win because documents were true, documents were genuine. And we had done a good work and WikiLeaks had done a good work revealing these documents revealing a story which would have been inaccessible without the WikiLeaks document. Finally, if you check the latest UN report on Sudan, if you check the latest UN report on Sudan, you probably know that Sudan is one of the countries which is under embargo by the UN. There is an arms embargo. And the UN inspectors, actually, the UN experts go there travel to Sudan and check whether this embargo is well respected, whether there are violations, whether sanctions are needed. So if you check this, last, this latest uh, document, which was published 
the 22nd of September, you will see how the UN inspector uses WikiLeaks documents to expose companies selling this military equipment to the Sudanese regime. So you will understand how even the UN <laughs> rely on these documents published by, by WikiLeaks. And this report uh, um, was uh, basically released one week ago after apparently Russia tried to stop its publication. So in, the, <laughs> in that case, no one said, well, <laughs> the, uh, WikiLeaks revealed some document, uh, but Russia didn't want to reveal. Uh, uh, no one said anything, but the, the, the documents uh, are used by the UN expert, and, and it was important to expose the companies violating uh, the embargo, the UN embargo against Sudan. So uh, that's why I keep working on the files, that keep, uh, keep working on the releases, because they, they bring these important documents which would be inaccessible otherwise. Thank you. Um, my name is John Getz, and I uh, work for, the, uh, for uh, NDR and for the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, and um, there was some misunderstanding, I think, in some of the, um, the uh, announcements that I, I work for WikiLeaks or something like that. That's not true. Just want to make that very clear. I'm a journalist that works for NDR and for the Süddeutsche Zeitung. And I, I was asked just to kind of talk about, you know, my experience over the years working uh, with WikiLeaks. Um, and it, it first began um, with the uh, Afghan war logs and the Iraq war logs and the diplomatic cables when I was working at Der Spiegel. And um, and it's continued today um, in my capacity uh, where I work now. Um, and we've used we've worked with WikiLeaks on some of the releases. We haven't done all of the releases. There've been you know and and basically we look at each um, release at a time and we look to authenticate and and uh, look at the value of the publication and then we decide based on that example if we're going to go ahead or not. Um, and it's just when I look back at the last six years that it's been for me, it's very interesting how I came very naive about encryption, about the safety of emails, the safety of, of downloading documents. I remember at the time I found all of that stuff completely irritating and like, <laughs> why are they wasting my time? These are really, really difficult people who um, like seem to take joy in making my life as a journalist difficult. And, and that was really how it felt like to me. Do you know what I mean? And like, and they were constantly harping on this whole security thing. And it was very interesting how now in the last six years that, that my attitude about that's really changed. A lot of it had to do through the work of WikiLeaks, but also, of course, what came out with Edward Snowden later on, that, that a lot of the things that they had been telling me that I thought was brain, that were brain dead were not brain dead. Um, so so that's, that was one thing. And there was also just one other thing I wanted to mention, that I did a lot of work on the Khalid al-Masri kidnapping case that Sarah had mentioned earlier before WikiLeaks had been involved in it. And, and there was actually, uh, there actually still is an arrest warrant today uh, from a German state prosecutor for the 13 CIA men who had kidnapped Khalid al-Masri. Uh, the Munich state prosecutor has an ongoing arrest warrant. Um, and one of the great <laughs> things for me in my work as a journalist was to see it, through WikiLeaks documents, documents released by WikiLeaks, the shadows of my work as a journalist in the government and how the, U, the, the U.S. government you know, put pressure on the chancellery about the stories that we were working on at the time to see um, um, how the justice ministry, there was pressure on them and to see kind of actually how politics works. Um, and it for me was just, and it remains one of the most interesting insights at that time. So um, if people want to know later on, I'm happy to talk to anyone individually about what, you know, what it's been like to be a journalist who works with WikiLeaks sometimes. And um, yeah, so that's. Does anybody have any sort of questions on working with us and our partnerships or anything like that that John and Steph could answer? No? No? All good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm Andrea Ashley with Reuters, but how do you 
you, from WikiLeaks' perspective, how do you decide which media organizations you work with? You have a sort of stable, you send the information out, and then as John is indicating, the media have a choice to decide yes or no. I mean, how do you, how do you decide that? And how did you do that in the very beginning, I imagine? Yeah, so um, we'd had some media partnerships for some uh, smaller size publications before uh, Cablegate. In the summer we had with the Afghan war logs, for example, a sort of smaller size one than we then came to have with about uh, three or four partners. Um, and as we rolled out Cablegate, essentially what it was was is that as we would start to um, uh, publish the cables to do with a certain region or country, we would basically analyze the media in that country and look at who had the best investigative teams um, and would therefore do justice to the material. Often we got more than one in each country. We actually um, discovered working with some of the media that uh, some media that um, stories will on purpose be missed because of a political bias of the editorial of a paper. So we would often actually get multiple media in a country, which in itself, how that worked, often ended up quite an interesting exercise in itself of what one would miss and one would get um, or miss on purpose. Um, and then going forward, um, we've then built up this very strong uh, partnership uh, with, with over 100 around the globe. And so if there's uh, documents relevant to a particular country or a particular interest in there, then we will approach the media partners that we have there already. Um, and if there's an area where we don't have, although we, we're getting very few countries now uh, in the world where we don't have good media partners, um, but if not, then we'll do the same process of analyzing and deciding. And, and then there's a, a bit of a process of teaching the security tools and how to work in a secure way with the documents. So there is a bit of lead in time, but, um, but that's, that's how. And then when a publication comes along, again, same analysis, who will be the best uh, media partners? What type of is our ideal partnership? And then we go and approach those people. Okay. Um, so through all of this, um, through all of these publications, we, we've had, uh, yes, the propaganda attacks, but also some legal attacks against us as well. Um, this began obviously in 2010 with the banking blockade. We've been working hard against that to not only get the blockade dropped, but to actually get some justice for it. Obviously for an organization that relies off donations when we were publishing um, hundreds of documents a day to not have that uh, uh, revenue stream coming in uh, was quite debilitating uh, for a while. But we pushed on through and we have managed to um, uh, predom predominantly successfully defeat the banking blockade. Um, we've won uh, court cases against Visa and MasterCard, um, and we're in the damages phase of that. So hopefully over um, the, the next few months and year, there will be uh, some updates on that case. But we are being uh, successful as that progresses. Um, we then, of course, had um, a, a lot of uh, surveillance, electronic, uh, some of it mass. Uh, surveillance and some of it obviously targeted. Um, Julian Assange is in an embassy where um, although there was uh, several months ago the Met police did put out a statement that they were taking away their overt surveillance, they did state that they were going to be upping the covert surveillance. Um, but, um, sorry. I thought there was a question, sorry to pause. Um, but yeah, so um, I had a particular um, I interaction with some of, the, um, uh, some of the, the US grand jury case against us and the surveillance that we get um, a couple of Christmases ago. I got a lovely Christmas present from Google um, where they sent me uh, finally after having, been, uh, after having been keeping it secret for two years they sent me uh, the subpoena that they'd had on my emails. Now, it was interesting that this was a private email account before I joined WikiLeaks, so this really goes to show the dragnet nature of the investigation in the United States um, that Melinda will talk uh, more about in a second. Um, and 
just before she comes on, I just sort of want to say that for we've really seen with the grand jury in the U.S. from a member of staff that this is really, we can see that it is trying to get our boss, our editor-in-chief, Julian Assange, but it's quite... Um, quite worrying for all of us as members of staff that they're willing to go to these lengths where my private emails, you know, with my family, etc., were caught up in this dragnet surveillance to try and get um, Julian on uh, criminal codes such as uh, espionage, conspiracy to commit espionage, computer fraud and abuse acts. These are all very serious crimes in the United States. And this is on top of something I just want to illustrate now because I think it shows it quite well. This sort of surveillance and these sorts of um, uh, secret legal threats that the U.S. government has been, or the U.S. has been making against us, have also come from a number of government officials um, in quite a personal way ever since 2010 they began. Terrorists. Cyber terrorists and information terrorism. Shut it down. We're going to have to use a drone or something. Abort the brain. Illegally shoot the son of a. Information warfare is warfare. And Julian Assange is engaged in warfare. Information terrorism, which leads to people getting killed, is terrorism. And Julian Assange is engaged in terrorism. He should be treated as an enemy combatant. WikiLeaks should be closed down permanently and decisively. Should the United States do something to stop Mr. Assange? We're looking at that right now. The Justice Department is taking a little look at that. I would argue that it's closer to being a high-tech terrorist than the, than the Pentagon Papers. This disclosure is not just an attack on America's foreign policy interests. It is an attack on the international community. The, the head of WikiLeaks is not a particularly credible source in my mind. He's, he is a, you know, to me, in my mind, he's a, he's a criminal, and he ought to be uh, hunted down and grabbed and uh, put on trial for what he has done here. I think the man is a high-tech terrorist. Um, he's done in the Assange. Yeah. yeah. He, he needs to be prosecuted to the full, fullest extent of the law, and if that becomes a problem, we need to change the law. Well, I think Assange should be assassinated, actually. I think Obama should put out a contract and maybe use a drone or something. We don't want to act panicked and have the... We don't want to act panicked. You can act tough and say, if we catch you, we're going to hang you. Yeah. Well, Whatever. We heard some of that from Holder. Julian Assange is a cyber terrorist in wartime. He's guilty of sabotage, espionage, crimes against humanity. He should be killed. How is it? How is it that the WikiLeaks guy remains free? You know, back in the old days when men were men in countries for countries, this guy would die of lead poisoning from a bullet in the brain, and nobody would know who put it there. The way to deal with this is pretty simple. We got special ops forces. I mean, uh, the dead man can't leak stuff. This guy's a traitor, a treasonous, and, and, and he has broken every law of the United States. The guy ought to be, and I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I don't want to do it, illegally shoot the son of a f It's time that the Obama administration treats WikiLeaks for what it is, a terrorist organization whose continued operation threatens our security. Shut it down. Shut it down. It is time to shut down this terrorist organization, this terrorist website, WikiLeaks. Shut it down, Attorney General Holder. So yeah, they're quite serious, um, quite serious threats there coming from some uh, very official people in the US. It's also came out just in the last couple of days that actually these sorts of uh, comments went, uh, came from Hillary Clinton's mouth as well, where she in a meeting um, questioned whether he could be droned or not. So to explain a little bit more about the current status and any updates of this US case, we have um, uh, one of uh, Julian's lawyers here, uh, Melinda Taylor. She's a criminal lawyer at the uh, ICC, and she led the UN case that we had just recently. Hi, everyone. Uh, this year, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention issued a landmark decision finding that Julian was a victim of illegal and arbitrary detention. They further found that the circumstances of his detention violated his right to protection from torture and cruel treatment. They found that Sweden and the United Kingdom had a duty to ensure his protection and security. 
This decision concerned the legal responsibilities of the UK and Sweden, and they were jointly responsible for keeping him in detention. But it was clear from the subtext of the decision that there was a larger villain lurking in the background. Indeed, in an email from the Crown Prosecution Services to their Swedish counterpart, it was underlined that, please do not think that this case is being dealt with as just another extradition request. And why was that? It's because the long arm of the US had reached out to its allies and indicated that it wanted Assange by any means possible. As a result, it's the ever-present risk of being carted off to face an unfair and abusive prosecution in the US that forms the, the bars that keeps Julian indefinitely detained. The complex legal decisions and actions that have given rise to this indefinite detention can be distilled to a few simple and irrefutable facts. There is an ongoing national security prosecution of both Julian and WikiLeaks. It is the largest investigation under the Espionage Act in US history, and it is the largest cybersecurity prosecution in the US Army. This prosecution has already given rise to several legal abuses and mistreatment. Chelsea Manning was interrogated in relation to both Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. The UN Special Rapporteur on Torture found that the interrogation methods applied to her amounted to torture. As Sarah mentioned, in 2012, the Department of Justice issued secret subpoenas to Google to obtain email accounts with private, personal, privileged information, and barely, there was barely a whimper of protest before they were given up. On 28th of January 2015, a spokesperson for the Eastern District of Virginia confirmed that the criminal investigation into Julian is ongoing, and the risk presented by this prosecution has only grown in the last few years. Mr. Assange was and is a thorn in the side of US politicians who would prefer that their dirty secrets and mistakes are hidden from the very people who have the power to either elect or dismiss them. The inability to view Julian or WikiLeaks with any level of impartiality has just been emphasized by the recent smear campaign caused by the DNC leaks. Once again, the specter of reds under the beds has been resurrected. Just because WikiLeaks dared to publish information, for example, about Hillary Clinton's policy failings and her short-sighted and flawed approach to international interventions, for example, in Libya. He published this, therefore he must be anti-American. He must be an enemy of state. They don't see him as a publisher. They see him as an enemy combatant who must be brought to heel by any means possible. Julian has even been published on an NSA man-hunting list, along with other members of terrorist organizations. And as Sarah mentioned, there was reports that came out recently that Hillary Clinton, in a, a meeting, proposed to just drone the guy. And while this has been going on, both Sweden and the United Kingdom have refused to give any assurances that he won't be handed over to the US if he were to go to Sweden. And of course they hide behind technical reasons for their refusal. Or we haven't received a formal request from the US for his extradition. Or we can only give him an assurance that he won't be given to the US after he leaves the embassy and after he comes to Sweden. It's just like the big bad wolf is outside the doors of the Ecuadorian embassy. He's trying to huff and puff and blow it down. And now he's trying to convince Julian to leave. Come out, Julian. I might be chomping on a Chelsea Manning sandwich, that might be Edward Snowden in a frying pan behind me, but you'll be safe if you come. And so the stalemate continues. Julian remains detained because the UK and Sweden continue to flout their international obligations and their duty to protect him from this risk. But even though Julian has been locked up, they haven't been able to silence him or WikiLeaks. Over the last five years, Whilst Julian was detained, WikiLeaks has continued to publish 
key information that has changed the world. Without WikiLeaks, this information would have remained unknown or obscured, and, but it has now empowered people throughout the world to know where the perimeters of responsible government ends and the shadowy outlines of Big Brother commences. WikiLeaks documents are not created, culled or pieced together to support a particular political narrative, and as a result, they show both sides of the coin. As an example, it was the detailed minutia of corruption and excesses that were set out in leaked US diplomatic cables that acted as a catalyst for the Arab Spring. But the diplomatic emails and cables leaked by WikiLeaks were also instrumental in revealing the political machinations that both preceded and accompanied the NATO intervention in Libya. For example, one can see in Hillary Clinton's emails that she was aware of the profile of Saif Gaddafi as a potential reformer. She was aware of potential peace plans that could have avoided further civilian casualties. The US were aware, even later, that if he was tried in Libya, it would be inevitable that he would be given the death penalty. Nonetheless, all of this was avoided or ignored because of the political calculus between securing oil contracts as compared to protecting civilian lives. So these documents have had a range of repercussions in a range of areas. They're used by both the Victims' Council and Defence Council international courts and tri tribunals. And that is because they help to establish the truth. Truth might be a universal value, but it's a rare commodity. Not everyone has equal access to authentic evidence. If you're a sitting head of state or a head of a multinational corporation, often you can conjure up documents at a minute's notice. But if you're a human rights defender, a political opponent or a dissenter, it's very hard to get access to evidence to help prove claims or protect your rights. But by making troves of authentic documents freely available, WikiLeaks has leveled the legal playing field. Thanks to WikiLeaks, you don't have to be a government crony or an insider to get information concerning, for example, the collateral murder of civilians and journalists in Iraq, mistreatment of detainees in Guantanamo Bay, US spying on foreign diplomats, unfair and unbalanced trade agreements. Today's event has been convened to mark the 10th year anniversary of the registration of WikiLeaks. These 10 years have transformed the notion of democracy and human rights. Because of WikiLeaks, people throughout the world have the power to know what is being done, why it's being done, and by whom it's being done. Through this knowledge, they can more fully participate in the world they live in and protect their rights. I would like to thank Julian. The, the UN decision, just so that you can get the wording of that that Melinda was just referring to, this is the announcement of it. The Julian Assange has been arbitrarily detained by Sweden and the United Kingdom since his arrest in London on 7 December 2010 as a result of the legal action taken against him by both governments. The expert panel called on the Swedish and British authorities to end Mr. Assange's deprivation of liberty, I think the recommendation is quite clear, respect his physical integrity and freedom of movement, and afford him the right to compensation. And despite that UN ruling that came several months ago, Julian is still um, in the Ecuadorian Embassy in London, although hopefully via video to us right now. These things never work just as they're meant to, huh? Why, please? <laughs> we heard that, Julian. <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> Wait, hold on, you were just a random voice, sort of weirdly echoing, sort of in an omnipresent fashion down to us. Um, Come on, Scotty. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, just sort of sort of Sorry for the delay. We're just sorting that out for just a couple of seconds. Does anybody have a question um, from the legal side whilst we're just trying to set that up that um, Melinda might be able to answer? Um, yes. Um, I don't know if you want to make sort of a general comment. I would say that on a specific, the specific announcement, the sort of, um, it, I know it sounds a bit bad, but it's a bit of a guess out clause, but obviously the nature of sort of a security issue for him is one that we can't really go uh, into too much. Um, oh, we've got him, sorry. Happy birthday. Thank you. This is true, it's not Ruth, actually. <laughs> Uh, I actually didn't hear much of what went on because uh, you need to be uh, close to the uh, mic with technical uh, computers. But okay, um, so I understand uh, we're in the Volkswagen, uh and I have to thank the Volkswagen for uh, Volkswagen, uh again for uh, letting us use that space. It's uh, a quite important place uh, in the way. Um, okay, so let me get my notes and we'll begin. Uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes, is that right? We're running a little over time. No? But, yeah. Uh, I'll try and cut it to a good thing so we have time for questions. Um, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, WikiLeaks has released 10 million documents comprising of 10 million words. And why uh, numbers are not everything, uh, they're a start. That information uh, that never would have existed in the world uh, had we not released it. They would have been stored away somewhere privately, uh, but it wouldn't have become part of our uh, collective uh, civilizational knowledge. And um, it corresponds to approximately 3,000 documents a day on average. Uh, that's a hell of a lot of work. Uh, that's why we don't release uh, every single day. Uh, we do things at scale um, in order to, uh, say, uh, release uh, 100,000 documents at once. But it does pan out to about uh, 3,000 uh, documents per day. Now, why uh, do this at all? Uh, I am in a position uh, where uh, I've been detained without charge here in the UK, in one form or another, prison, house arrest, the last four years in the embassy, um, as a result uh, of this work. Uh, some of our sources, uh, um, or red sources, uh, have suffered terrible consequences uh, in the United States. Actually, not many. Uh, we have thousands, uh, and there's only couple of the resources that are uh, facing difficulty, but um, altogether, uh, in sources and supporters, uh, people have uh, been sentenced to uh, something like uh, 50 years uh, altogether. And the two most significant uh, cases are uh, is that of Chelsea Main in the United States, uh, sentenced to 35 years in prison, uh, purely for communicating uh, with the media, that's the allegation. There's no other allegation uh, against them. Um, the United Nations found that they had been uh, tortured uh, by the public to cruel and inhumane uh, treatment uh, akin to torture. Uh, Jeremy Hammond uh, imprisoned in New York uh, for 10 years. And a number, a number of supporters back in the, the heat of the kind of um, first uh, phase of neo-McCarthyist hysteria in the United States uh, in 2010-2011 uh, um, went through a legal process as well. Uh, most of them uh, have got off uh, without uh, any imprisonment. But, okay, what, what does it teach you? Well, it teaches you something uh, about the structure of power. Whenever WikiLeaks engages in a release, um, well, the information that we reveal uh, about an institution, 
how about uh, a state uh, is interesting. Uh, but also the reactions uh, by the institution of the state are extremely revealing, uh, and the reactions by uh, tertiary players, uh, such as particular media groups and their alignment, allied institutions, and so on. And this, in some way, harkens back to the old statement of Voltaire that if you want to understand uh, structure of power, you should see uh, who it is that you have difficulty um, writing about. Well, my, myself, myself, and our sources, uh, we believe uh, in some kind of romantic ideal. It's quite a, a quaint notion. It's quite a um, clinical notion. It's quite a notion, in fact, that uh, perhaps in some ways doesn't belong uh, to this time, it belongs to an older time, uh, or perhaps a future time, uh, which is that um, through understanding the world, we can do something sane, we can do something rational. Um, it's not uh, something of a, as being out of a postmodernist view, uh, of extremely bounded uh, rationality, uh, where everything is kind of pointed. Uh, we actually think um, it's fascinating uh, to understand the world around us, and through this understanding, uh, we can see just this comfort, as we have in, in many cases, uh, some of which uh, Sarah has pointed out. Uh, in fact, you can break down um, this quest uh, for knowledge and understanding into really the three types of history. And by history, uh, uh, journalists will understand that uh, I don't mean what happened a hundred years ago, or not only what happened a hundred years ago. I mean history, certainly now, uh, the history uh, that is unfolding all around us. What are the three types? So, type one, uh, the, the history which is subsidized, uh, where there is uh, economic interest in propelling it and promoting it. Uh, that of course includes all kinds of advertising and propaganda, uh, but it also includes very basic things, uh, such as uh, how to hammer in particular types of nails, how to how to build a pump, uh, how to buy an airplane. Extremely important information uh, for one that has an existing industry propelling it forth into the world. Uh, my two history. Mm. This is unsubsidized history. History which has lost its economic subsidy, knowledge which is no longer propelled in the world but sits there and perhaps slowly decays. Uh, that's important to try in case to buy that knowledge, but generally speaking, uh, it's not kept around because uh, people don't find it interesting enough to keep around. And then there's the type 3 history, uh, and that is the type uh, that will be this is important, and that I have been interested in uh, all my adult life. And that is subjugated history. It is the history where there is an active effort uh, to prevent it entering the world. And this uh, type of history, uh, if we can find it, if we can uh, grab hold of it, if we can put it in uh, to civilization and our collective memory, this is a type of history. Uh, that would not have otherwise existed. Um, that's true for nearly every document public. It would not have otherwise existed uh, as something to be discussed uh, by uh, people of different languages and different cultures. Um, a good example of that uh, is, uh, say, the Iraq uh, war logs. That's uh, a um, a rich uh, documentation of the history of a war, in fact, the history of two countries, and it would not have otherwise uh, been present for the people of those countries or for the other countries that were involved in those wars to understand and, and derive lessons from. So, through uh, collecting this type of knowledge, subjugated history, uh, we have built uh, this romantic ideal. Um, of a grand rebel library. That's what we do. It is a rebel library, a, a type of library of Alexandria. Uh, I think Alexandria, I think we probably have more documents than Alexandria, uh, but it is 
uh, a library that is not like any other library. Um, we have the first uh, moment of what we bring into the world being present, as opposed to uh, copies of other books, which might be interesting, but uh, we're in the quest of trying to find original documents that have never been seen before and bringing them uh, into our collective knowledge understanding. Okay, so um, Sarah uh, has spoken about uh, some of the technical details uh, and a bit about practical history. Uh, I want to speak now um, about some of the things we're doing uh, going forward, uh, the future of Wikileaks. Well, I know this, I've, I've seen the internet and I understand that there's enormous expectation uh, in the United States. Uh, but, uh, some of that expectation will be partly answered, but um, you should understand that uh, if we're going to make a major publication uh, in relation to the United States uh, at a particular hour, we don't do it at 3 a.m. Uh, that's something uh, um, uh, so, uh, we have um, a great many uh, upcoming now, WikiLeaks has grown into a relatively uh, long position. Um, we're a publishing organization that has no debts, uh, has never had to fire anyone, uh, is entirely funded uh, by our readers, um, has uh, succeeded uh, in every litigation uh, that it's been involved in. Uh, I think that puts us in an enviable, enviable position um, of being completely independent, uh, not being dependent on uh, dodgy uh, foundations uh, or advertisers uh, or state funds uh, or uh, exceedingly wealthy uh, benefactors, which of course uh, always have their own interests. But nonetheless, uh, the material that WikiLeaks is going to publish before the end of the year uh, is of a significant um, moment, such a significant moment, in different directions affecting um, uh, three uh, powerful organizations uh, in three different states, as well as, of course, uh, information previously referred to about the U.S. electoral process. But WikiLeaks needs to change in order to survive and thrive through the next few months. Uh, now, why we have been growing, um, and why we are, while we are in a position to, uh, and I expect to uh, be able to uh, build up to about uh, 100 additional uh, journalistic staff over the next two years, um, we are going to need uh, an army. Uh, not an army, of course, in, uh, engaged in uh, physical hostilities, but we are going to need an army uh, to defend us uh, from uh, the pressure that is already starting to arrive. Uh, that, that pressure uh, is being placed um, uh, on a number of elements close to us. It is being uh, placed in one way or another. Uh, uh, on um, the state uh, that has uh, courageously uh, given me asylum. Uh, it will not uh, succeed. Uh, there will be uh, consequences uh, for it, uh, if necessary. Um, of course, uh, if I'm not able to continue, or um, the Ecuadorian people are uh, unreasonably uh, blamed uh, for WikiLeaks publications, I will have to resign as editor. But uh, our publications uh, will continue. So part of um, uh, the necessary defense uh, of WikiLeaks, um, we have uh, engaged in a new project uh, to um, uh, recruit uh, uh, people across the world uh, to defend our publications. Uh, and. Uh, we'll give uh, details of that as the weeks go by, but um, immediately uh, you can start following on Twitter uh, WL Task Force, 
Well, that at WL Task Force, bit.com slash WL Task Force, uh, and Community WL, uh, follow those, uh, and we will uh, issue uh, guidelines uh, about how you can uh, promote um, uh, WikiLeaks publications uh, for benefit censorship. Um, and uh, we will also give, if necessary, um, effective uh, call to arms uh, if the pressure uh, increases a lot more than it already has, which I expect almost certainly with a bill um, uh, for us. Uh, um, the uh, funding model of FAS uh, is a very interesting um, model. FAS is a, a German uh, newspaper, um, and it's something that we have been working on for a while. Uh, WikiLeaks will uh, uh, soon launch a membership system uh, where we will give uh, voting rights in relation to 20% uh, of the discretionary uh, expenditure uh, we have. Uh, it's important to keep us uh, in independent and keep a uh, sustained um, and predictable income uh, as opposed to uh, um, significant uh, income coming from the times of publication, but in the times of uh, between publications where there's extensive litigation, uh, then um, the funding is more unpredictable, which is a difficult position to be in uh, if you're in the middle of litigation. Um, um, okay, on uh, upcoming uh, journalism, because we have uh, so many uh, uh, publications uh, due before the end of the year, uh, we're in, a, in both an enviable position uh, and also in a very difficult position of having of having um, um, more than um, a million documents uh, to get through of many, of many different sources. Uh, we need to increase our um, number of press partnerships. We have about 110 different organizations uh, over the years. I think there's about 89 uh, active at the moment. I think Sarah might have I, I displayed them before. But we need to increase the number, uh, especially in the United States. Uh, so journalists that are interested uh, in uh, taking one angle or another on upcoming public and getting embargoed access, uh, we do need to be a publication which has significant impact. Um, write to press at wikileaks.org uh, and uh, tell us what your circulation is and what the medium is uh, and what your uh, subject matter expertise is. Um, we have a book uh, which has just come out, that is the WikiLeaks Files. Um, it is out now in the United Kingdom. Uh, it is 40% off this week at Verso. So if you just uh, Google Verso uh, WikiLeaks Files, or search for it and send it away. Uh, that's a free book. Uh, and it's available by ebook as well. Uh, we have another book coming out later this year. Uh, uh, these uh, two books, which I've written here uh, in the embassy, one about Google uh, and one about uh, cyberpunks, how cryptography um, permits uh, journalists and others to um, protect themselves from uh, mass surveillance. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, it must be the green. Um, okay. Um, now, up, up, upcoming pub, publications. Uh, we hope to be publishing every week for the next 10 weeks. Uh, now, we have on schedule, uh, it, and it's a very hard schedule, uh, all the US election related documents to come out uh, before November 8. Uh, our upcoming series uh, include significant material uh, from war, from arms, from oil, from Google, uh, on the US election, uh, and on mass surveillance. Uh, so journalists who are interested in those subjects, uh, please write to press at wikileaks.org. Um, we will uh, be beginning the uh, first uh, publication in that series uh, this week. 
I'm not going to specify the hour uh, because, of course, uh, all the best wax uh, get ready uh, to try and spin in the other direction. Uh, okay, so finally, uh, so we can get on to questions, uh, there's a lot of thank yous. I'm going to uh, avoid 10 years worth of thank yous. Uh, needless to say, uh, um, an endeavor like WikiLeaks uh, comes about um, as a result uh, of the efforts for a great many people and institutions, um, um, common allies, uh, love uh, of what we're doing, um, and in some cases, sympathy and the, the thrill um, uh, of doing something that's important. Uh, so I, I don't want to uh, give um, a map uh, of, the, of all the important people um, by thanking them. Um, but that necessarily isn't um, a suggestion that everyone I'm about to mention is not important. So it's a mixture. Um, first of all, uh, the committed team uh, of brave uh, technicians and journalistic staff uh, that make WikiLeaks what it is, um, which is a, uh, an organization which has technical understanding uh, at its core. That is our speciality, that is our um, comparative. Uh, uh, our sources, of course, without which uh, none of this uh, is possible. Um, we will always uh, keep your trust and do the best to get the best impact possible for you. Um, uh, we've shown over the years uh, that we do. Um, our readers, supporters, uh, and defenders uh, who keep our mission going. Um, a lot of staff uh, and a lot of legal battles uh, cost a lot of money. Uh, and uh, it's only through um, the funding uh, of our readers and supporters uh, that we're able to keep uh, that big ship going. Uh, our increasingly uh, formidable legal team, um, the public, so it can be named, uh, including uh, Balthazar Gazon, Barry Pollack, Margaret Kunstler, in the United States, um, Lynn Taylor, Gareth Pierce, Stella Morris, Renata Abilia, Terry Schenken, Jennifer Robinson, Julian Burnside, Greg Barnes, uh, and more than 100 other lawyers in different countries, uh, nearly all of whom uh, work uh, are done over their expenses. Uh, our allies, media partners, uh, and other defenders in hundreds of institutions and countries, uh, especially the Center for Constitutional Rights in the United States, uh, FFDN, uh, Reporters Sans Frontiers, Human Rights Watch, uh, the ACLU, and the Freedom of Press Foundation in the United States. Uh, Professor Gavin McFadgen, um, who's in a very uh, difficult um, way at the moment in terms of his health, Susan Penn uh, and John Pilger, uh, who should be personally thanked. Uh, the people and government of Ecuador uh, and the United Nations uh, who have courageously respected my human rights uh, despite considerable pressure over the years. Uh, the people of Germany, the uh, Holland uh, Foundation, uh, Der Spiegel, the Deutsche Zeitung, uh, the CCC, uh, Angela and Daniel Victor, uh, John Gertz, uh, and there's many others who I mentioned. Uh, and uh, last, but perhaps uh, most significantly, uh, those who died fighting in this business. Uh, Michael Ratner, the uh, legal counsel. Uh, John Jones, uh, who together with Melinda Taylor presented uh, our UN decision. Uh, Aaron Schwartz, Lenny Wineglass, another one of our lawyers, um, rest in power. Thanks. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, so we have some time to take some questions. Um, yeah, sure. There's obviously been a lot of speculation in the US that the leaks are about to come out as an absolute destroyer. Julian, do you want to take that one? Because I think it's the false quoting of you that's uh, the... 
the, the, the issue on some of this. Oh, sorry. Um, it was a referring to, do we have any comment on um, whether the upcoming publications to do with the U.S. elections will destroy Clinton or not? Um, there has been a lot of misquoting uh, of me and um, uh, WikiLeaks publications. Uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, the mis misquoting has to do with that uh, we intend to harm Hillary Clinton, or I intend to harm Hillary Clinton, or I don't like Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, all those are false. Uh, they come about as a result uh, principally, it seems, uh, of um, uh, you know, this campaign and, and vendors are uh, uh, trying to personalize uh, our publications. Um, our upcoming publication significant in relation to the U.S. election? Yeah, we think they're, we think they're significant. Um, do, do they um, show interesting features uh, of U.S. Uh, power factions? Uh, and how they operate. Yes, they do. Any other questions? Yeah, um, sorry, me again. Mrs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Julian also implicate, uh, implied that uh, there's been some kind of uh, threats towards the Ecuadorian people as a result of uh, Ecuador giving Julian the time. Can you elaborate more on exactly what kind of pressure they're under? Um, is Julian, do you want to, uh, it, uh, the question is, you seem to have referenced that um, Ecuador or the Ecuadorian people have been threatened because of the decision to give you asylum. Is that what you said, stroke meant, and can you elaborate any more? I didn't, I didn't say threatened, I said that there is significant pressure. It is, um, if you read the Ecuadorian press, um, you see some of that uh, in play. Um, in relation to other forms of pressure uh, and developments uh, in, the United, in the United States in response to our upcoming publications uh, and the uh, DNC leaks, um, well, we have a lot of sources, uh, and those sources are uh, in uh, US politics, uh, intelligence organizations, and their equivalents in the United Kingdom. And so, yeah. We know when there are developments afoot, and we're uh, aware of them, and we, are, we will understand them and react accordingly. Uh, yes? Um, so far during this election cycle, uh, you focused on uh, leaks from the DNC. Uh, can you specify if uh, upcoming re releases, including before the election, would also affect the Republicans? Can you go that far? Um, that was um, trying to get into content of upcoming releases, re the elections. Will it also cover Republicans? I mean, I, I, we generally don't go into sort of content of releases for quite specific reasons um, in that um, uh, part of bringing the impact and also ensuring or trying to minimize the, the ability to get up a spin before uh, we've actually gone live um, is one of the reasons why we keep the, the releases so confidential. So there are, there are good reasons for it. I don't know if you want to elaborate any more, Julian, though, on the Republican-Democrat um, um, spin that people have tried to... It's, there's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, fascinating angles that are unexpected. I think he can't hear what we're saying, so it's, he was talking about the, the, the uh, publication, he said there's a lot of fascinating angles, that was the quote that he used, he can't really, the sound I back to it, yeah, it's, <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll go to the lady first and then come to you if that's okay. Yeah. Um, if you look at what you've, you've summarized this now, what you've accomplished over the past 10 years, looking ahead to the next 10, what are your goals overall specifically? Like, what do you hope to accomplish in the next decade with WikiLeaks? Uh, the lady said, looking at the last past 10 years and then looking at the decade going forward, what do you hope to accomplish with WikiLeaks? What are your goals? Uh, 
in the goals going forward. Well, yeah, we're, going we're forward under, for a decade. Yeah, I mean, we've come to understand something about um, human modern human institutions and how they work, um, and how how it works, and how it's how it's shifting, uh, and that gives some ability. Um, as everyone knows, it's always needed to to look forward and, and understand where things are going. Um, I, I don't think I'll surprise anyone by saying that, that we're going in next year into a pretty serious um, space in the, the global um, geopolitical order uh, as a result of either of the two current good presidential candidates uh, and the power factions that are behind them uh, and uh, when uh, acts America in different ways uh, and the three the, the shifting uh, from um, um, a predictable uh, state power uh, into an assembly of unpredictable uh, state powers and major corporations are uh, acting more and more like states. And why that was talked back in the, in the 1990s that the, that the state was at an end, actually um, something really very different is, is happening now. But I don't think something that could have been foreseen at that stage. So as far as WikiLeaks is concerned, the more, the more we're in an interesting position, but the more that the world globalizes and digitizes, uh, the greater comparative advantage WikiLeaks has. Similarly, uh, the greater the levels of uh, censorship, um, including self-censorship, um, the greater WikiLeaks comparative advantage is as a, an organization that was built legally and technically uh, and to a degree politically uh, to uh, the gentleman at the back. Yeah, my question is, is that you released 10 million documents in 10 years, which makes 3,000 documents per day. Uh, how do you make sure that you know what you're talking about? Yeah. Anybody can use 3,000 documents a day, there's lots of volunteers, or how does it work? Um, do you want to go with this one? Oh, sorry, you can't hear. Um, he's, um, the, the question is regarding the stats that we've published, um, the, of how much we've published. Um, we say it's an average of 3,000 documents per day. How do we verify at those quantities? Do you want to talk about? Sure. Um, yes, of course, that would be impossible. Uh, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be impossible. It would be very hard uh, if we dealing with 3,000 new sources per day, one source, one document, times 3,000. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of verifying uh, collections, uh, and verifying um, something about that the source or the original source of these meters are related to a collection uh, of material. So we do you know, enormous batches of, of in some cases, in one case with uh, maybe five million uh, documents, for example. I, if I can just add as well, I think this goes back to what Julian was just referring to about how we have um, quite a niche within our organization and that we um, have large levels of uh, technical expertise at our core. And we have learned through our publishing model and progressing in this specialization in large archives. And they are just a different nature. There's still the same journalistic processes, RE validation, um, source protection, etc. But when you're talking about large archives, they're just a slightly different nature of the documents. And so your processes for validation um, are, uh, are quite specific to working with large data sets rather than, as you say, obviously reading 3,000 individual documents a day that come from different places um, is quite a different type of task. Um, yep, the gentleman just at the back there. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to do that one, Julian, or 
the, oh, sorry, you can't, I keep forgetting you can't hear them, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, the uh, gentleman was just asking the question about the malware, um, and he stated that um, a Bulgarian researcher has found much malicious malware on our site, um, and just wanted, I guess, an explanation of, of, of that one. Well, sure, I mean, it's quite, it's quite, as I said before, uh, when WikiLeaks publishes something, you get uh, what we publish, which is interesting. Uh, you get the reaction by the institution concerned, which is interesting. Uh, and then you get the reaction by the allies uh, or those people sucking up to the economic or political gradient of the institution concerned. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign uh, has been going around uh, saying, don't read WikiLeaks because there's malware. Um, and it's been there quite aggressively, and, and her sympathizers uh, as well. Um, yeah, and so people have been trying to push that. But the reality is, um, we are very interested in pristine sources. So WikiLeaks materials have been gone to, gone on to be used in a great many number of legal cases. Um, so we're not interested in in kind of you know in censoring uh, our materials uh, or redacting them uh, at all in general. But very occasionally uh, we might redact for a limited period of time if there's some uh, security situation involving uh, some person, um, but only for a limited period of time. Um, and the case of uh, where. For example, in the AKP, the Turkish uh, uh, ruling political party of Erdogan, uh, where we published around 200,000 uh, of their uh, emails from this, most, most of them from this year, some from the year before, but all published this year. Um, uh, there was malware sent to the AKP, uh, either from uh, criminal gangs or from state um, uh, attacks uh, on the AKP. Now, that's extremely interesting. Uh, and it's not something we're going to censor. Now, uh, does that mean that readers of WikiLeaks' website uh, are infected by that malware by reading our website? No, this is malware that targets email. That's an attachment. You can't, you can't be infected by reading our website. You have to download um, the attachments in EXE and then um, open it on your desktop and ignore the warnings, etc. So just like just like downloading any um, information on the website. And if you, if you play it that way, uh, there's a chance of it. Now we're just like, now we can be in your email box as well. Um, there's some other questions. Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the changes that you signaled in the way that WikiLeaks is structured. And if you can just go into that, and is it the financial pressure primarily that's driving you, or what is behind those? Uh, you know, changes and, and what kind of timetable for that to all be announced? Um, so the changes in structure, the lady was asking a question about the changes in structure you were talking about. Um, uh, I don't know if they were, you would describe them as changes in structure or just sort of increase, but she was to, uh, wanted to know any more about these and particularly the um, donation side that you'd referred to and what the time scale is on these changes to take place of the uh, upcoming uh, more organizational changes rather than just publications? Uh, well, I mean, some of these things are immediate. As I said, uh, our effort to build a very sizable uh, community and bring in the public as a task force to analyze, amplify uh, our publications and to uh, defend us against what is a really quite remarkable um, uh, you know, McCarthyist push uh, in the United States at the moment. Um, principally by Hillary Clinton uh, allies because she happens to be uh, the person being exposed at the moment. Um, uh, if you're talking about our um, uh, in terms of uh, members, uh, membership system uh, that we've produced uh, similar to our fans, uh, that's been rolled out. Um, uh, now we have, we have an internal uh, beta uh, it's something that will occur uh, over the remainder of the year. Uh, we hope to have it, uh, uh, the uh, membership sign-up uh, system uh, done uh, in about 30 days. Um, 
person back there. Yes, just a, a question in regards to the legal situation. Um, we've seemingly gone through a, a lot of different avenues. Can you shed any light on perhaps what comes next? Or perhaps how conflict you may be in resolving the legal situation from um, Legal, are you talking about sort of with the US grand jury? Are you talking? Um, there's a question about your personal legal situation within the embassy and what's uh, possible next for you in your case. You. Can you hear me? What's the question? Oh. <laughs> um, what's next for you in uh, your personal legal situation there at the embassy? Well, I mean, it's all politics, right? Uh, the, the, law, the law is clear. The UN, the UN has ruled on the matter. Uh, the United Kingdom um, is not only has discard, discarded uh, the EU, uh, uh, and of course says good and bad things about the EU, um, it is committed, uh, the government is committed, and it's said so repeatedly, um, it is going to uh, withdraw uh, its um, Human Rights Act um, so it's scrap the UK Human Rights Act and attempt uh, to either completely withdraw uh, from the European Court of Human Rights or substantially uh, withdraw the impact of the European Court of Human Rights. So it's, you know, um, I mean, a country that doesn't follow the law. Um, yes? <laughs> Sorry, it's just very funny when you know. Um, do you, do you feel <laughs> do you feel any affinity with Donald Trump? This is in the context of some of the tweets, and I suppose this uh, accusation that um, you're for Trump because against Clinton is the the accusation that people try to make. And so the question was in the context of this and our Twitter feed: um, Do you feel any personal affinity with Trump? <laughs> Uh, you need to, the mic's a bit muffled, so you need to speak C clearly. Yeah. Do uh, you feel any personal affinity with Trump? With Trump? <laughs> uh, that was the question, that's yes. That's a, no, it's an interesting question. Um, I feel personal affinity, really, I think, with all human beings. Uh, you can, you can through understanding someone and what drives them, you can feel sorry for them. Um, uh, I certainly feel sorry and for Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Uh, that's a, a kind of human sympathy. These, these are two people that are, um, are tormented uh, by their ambitions uh, in different ways. Um, any other questions? <laughs> yep, just sit in the back there, gentlemen. Um, so this is talking about, you were explaining there's a number of different publications coming up. Are you able to give any more specificity on when uh, one specifically to do with the elections will be coming? I know you've said there'll be several over the next weeks. Um, uh, I think the statement I made was clear. Um, that uh, our first publications in the series are this week. I haven't said whether you are selection related or not. I would like to keep uh, that ambiguity, but uh, we have a, um, a quite a pace um, ahead of us. Um, any? Yeah, sir. Could you ask me to clarify his comment about how Brexit may change his legal status? I don't quite understand whether you're saying it's an opportunity for potentially a risk. Yep, sure. Um, can you just do a quick clarification on your Brexit statement and that this could have uh, changes for your legal case? Uh, did you mean that specifically more as an opportunity or as a, a risk for your legal case? Well, the, the Brexit 
is a, a slight risk in relation to um, there uh, no longer be appeals to the European Courts of Justice. Um, so there's certain avenues that are cut off there. Um, on, on the other hand, I mean, I have a lot of legal cases. So we have the US case, and the UK is sticking to the problem tonight with US extradition warrant that will be landed in the UK. Uh, we have the UK bail case, which they're trying to arrest me over seeking asylum in the first place, which of course is completely illegal, uh, but they're attempting to do it anyway. And we have the Swedish extradition warrant, uh, which there's no charges for. Um, so that in relation to Swedish extradition warrant, which is an almost rhetorical problem, um, and is used by the UK rhetorically to justify, although not legally, uh, that um, is going to face increasing political and legal difficulties. So the UK has said that it's it, it's going to grandfather in all existing EU law and then start knocking it out. But the the abuses of the EAW, uh, including by Sweden and including in my case, uh, were one of the things uh, that drove. Um, the UK at an intellectual level, in terms of its sovereignty debate, um, out of the European Union. Uh, so uh, and those de there were some significant debates about the abuses of the EAW in Parliament. Uh, so I would, be, um, I would be surprised if the EAW um, is not significantly um, um, attacked uh, as a result of things like exclusion without charge. Uh, in the UK Parliament as the transition occurs. Yeah. I asked uh, before about the, why the announcement wasn't made yesterday on the balcony. It wasn't quite answered. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. He came on halfway through. Um, uh, well, we could just ask. Yeah, the question is regarding um, can you give any further information on the reason you had to cancel your speech in London later today? Uh, the security was given, but do you have any anything else you can add? Uh, yes, we received information. Um, um, we received information that meant that the people involved in doing the security for the event believed that it shouldn't be done. Um, any other questions? Uh, one last one there, yeah. Um, how are you after four years in the embassy? How do you feel sort of physically? <laughs> you, you look all right to uh, us. A, a bit pale, a bit pale. Uh, <laughs> uh, having, yeah, a bit pale. As a, actually, I was thinking the other night, it, it, it'd be pretty interesting for vitamin D researchers, right? Because it's, it's, really, it's pretty rare that you have a subject that hasn't seen the sun in four years but is otherwise healthy. There's, there's a few people um, who um, are in hospitals, for example, uh, that are bedridden, can't, can't move, that rare, very rarely see the sun. I suppose they will that occasionally, but it's, um, and there's some space station um, people. Uh, I don't know if they've arranged for somewhere, but it's quite, it's quite rare that you have um, an otherwise um, healthy-ish person um, I have some other problems for being in the embassy, but they, these are not um, diabetes or something like that. One last question. What can Americans do to support refugees now that uh, it's been polarized as uh, every American is supporting them as a uh, you know, communist, but rather on the bad side for um, there was a question specifically in relation to the propaganda attacks that we receive, and uh, particularly from the U.S., and in that sort of context, do you have any advice for our supporters from America who may sort of uh, feel pressures to, for them to be maligned, etc., because of their support? Um, yeah, I mean, ro robustly engage with it. It's a, um, I mean, I love it. I, I, these propaganda attacks, are just, they're so amazing. Uh, I mean, they're pathetic and laughable in all sorts of cases, and dangerous in others, but um, they're so rev revelatory of the, the different um, associations, 
uh, in power between different groups. Um, so you should you should really see them as a an opportunity to understand um, who who's aligned with who and how uh, social and political uh, conformism works. It, it's a very accelerated um, process, and so one is able to see it um, unfolding uh, uh, in real time. In, in terms of combating it, um, I mean that was in. A, some of you may not know, but there was an incredible front page story of the New York Times a few weeks ago, um, in interior pages, about us, uh, uh, with no facts in the story at all. The only fact, or alleged, the only news in the story was that the US government said they couldn't find any connection between us and Russia. Um, that, was, that was the only fact. But the, the whole story was actually ended the other way, to have half incidences not even like absurd claims, coincidences, such as that um, I started speaking and campaigning about ROJ TV, um, which was the, the largest Kurdish language TV station, or at least it was, until a dirty deal which we exposed uh, between Barack Obama, the Turks, uh, the former Prime Minister of Norway, Rasmussen, uh, who was about to become the head of uh, NATO and did. Um, and the Danish uh, intelligence services and the Danish uh, prosecution authority uh, got together and decided to kill off ROJ TV, just, just eliminate it uh, legally. It was imported in Denmark, beamed up to Eurosat and, and beamed down again. Um, uh, and the case of um, now proceeding at the, at the European uh, Court of Human Rights. So our cables were real, the deal was done. Um, Turkey would only commit Rasmussen to become the head of NATO if they knocked off ROJ TV. Um, uh, so, because the ECHR case was on, I started speaking about this. Uh, and so, New York Times made, made the claim that Rasmussen was the head of NATO, and Putin didn't like the head of NATO, Rasmussen, that our talking about and drawing attention to um, what I think is actually the most interesting cable, or rather the most, the cable that kind of has it all, um, is the most recent cable, because it's got, you know, the collapse of separation of powers and liberal democracy, the Kurds, censorship, NATO, blah, blah, blah. Um, but this was somehow proof of, of, of uh, alignment. So these are, I mean, they're just pathetic kind of Arguments. If you go to justicecourtfunds.com, you can read the, the facts about uh, me and my situation uh, and use those to combat propaganda. Uh, and for WikiLeaks, uh, we have uh, they release uh, frequently distorted facts. If you go to wikileaks.org slash 10 years with a numeral 10, uh, wikileaks.org slash 10 years, uh, you can read about some of those uh, frequently distorted facts. But I, mean, I, I think it's a real opportunity to, to educate uh, people and, as I said, see the, the structure, power, and influence unfolding in real time uh, in this bizarre, liberal, uh, neo-McCarthyist hysteria that's unfolding in the United States. Yeah, we're sneaking one last question in. Yeah. This is quite a good one to end end this thing on. It's uh, okay. So, and correct me if I'm misrelaying any of this. Um, there is a trend that we're seeing of a rise of populist national uh, nationalist fronts. Is this, the there is see, a seemingly a reaction to what is seeming seen as a breakdown in the rule of law? 
Do you think that WikiLeaks' work has helped or hindered uh, actual transparency coming to this sort of um, uh, culture clash between the, the left and the right? Do, has your, do, we enforce, do we bring transparency? Do we enforce more secrecy to, through the reaction to the publication? Uh, I mean, well, you've got two things. There's really two parts to this question. One is about the rise of populism of different kinds, left populism, right populism. Uh, and the other is about what is the reaction by intransparent organizations to being made transparent by whistleblowers and activists and other sources. Um, well, the second case, this was a part of what um, I game played, played 10 years ago uh, in my discussions with others. Um, so if a intransparent organization that is involved in an abuse, abusive processes, um, not just a single individual doing something randomly, but some kind of structural abuse, uh, then of course it, it has two choices uh, in, in response to exposure. Uh, option A uh, is to stop the abuse of conduct. Um, so um, if, it is, if its internal workings are revealed, uh, it's not something that gets the uh, public or other institutions uh, outside and has a political economic cost as a result. Um, and option uh, B is uh, it can take everything off paper. It can, it can conceal its processes. But concealing processes uh, takes economic work. Um, and there, there's good reasons why um, systems are well documented. It's because they start to decay through uh, Chinese whispers or through the periphery not obeying the center um, as well if, things are not, if there's not a clear chain of command, etc. So sure, you can take everything off paper. You can, you can go completely oral. Uh, but the, the result is the a maximum size of the organization or the maximum size of that process within the organization will reduce. And therefore, the systematic quality uh, of abuse or injustice uh, produced by an organization which generates opponents, if it is known, um, uh, must similarly degrade uh, or the whole organization must uh, reduce in size because of the extra expense of doing things in this manner. Um, you know, in relation to, but it's basically a win-win. Um, you either get an organization which uh, is less abusive or an organization which is smaller because it's taxed uh, by its own secretive processes. Um, uh, in relation to uh, the rise of pop popularism, well, I mean, my, my analysis is that most of this is caused by um, the breaching or the, or the, or the gradual uh, degrading uh, of existing media hierarchies. Uh, and social media has clearly played a significant role, but as has uh, all the new media startups, new organizational startups, uh, where now every organization, um, uh, even a tiny one, is a publisher. It is able to publish its views on the world and its position, etc., directly, uh, rather than sending this uh, through gatekeepers. Um, so uh, as a result, um, established powers, which connect to large media organizations, they, I know there's a lot of journalists here that work for them, but I'm sorry they do, um, and create uh, standards, often very bad, usually to, to uh, prevent or make it costly for journalists to question existing established powers. Um, and just occasionally good, um, these are in decay. Um, and so as a result, the more common uh, sentiments of smaller organizations and individuals uh, start to rise, and it's only really natural that in response to that you see an increase in popularism. Um, and on that note, I'd like to say, Julian, thank you very much for joining us here in Berlin. Thank you to all the press for coming, and thank you to our supporters for, for being with us for 10 years and beyond. Thanks, guys.